All right, I'm Chad Gesser. Welcome back for some more sociology. And in this video, I'm going to cover some main topics in inequality, the terminology of inequality. Um, going forward, um, we will be covering uh, race and ethnicity, gender stratification, social class, and a few other forms of stratification that are common in sociology. Uh, other forms of stratification and inequality, I should know. Um, some of this terminology, historically, you don't see until uh, we start covering material on race and ethnicity. But it's certainly relevant across categories and topic matter relative to inequality. So I want to pull that out first and, and go over that and kind of set the stage for, for how we want to think about stratification and inequality once we get to subject specific matter in the next uh, couple of weeks. Okay, so um, the first thing that we want to talk about are the differences between stratification and inequality. Oftentimes they are used interchangeably, but they are definitely different, and uh, I want to draw attention to that. But the first thing that we want to do is look at what, what are we talking about in terms of social stratification. So. Stratification is a system by which a society ranks categories of people in a hierarchy. Now this, this notion of stratification as a system of who's in power, who's not in power kind of a thing um, can be found in very many different parts of society. So it's not just a matter of are rich people and poor people equal. It's also in the workplace. Is there inequality in the workplace? Do you have a boss? Is there equal power between employees? There's varying levels of stratification. So a hierarchy can mean lots of different things. It can mean also power is in the hands of one person, power is in the hands of everybody, and everything in between. Okay? So how do we rank people? Now that's done in various ways. Sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes it's very upfront. Um, but when we're talking about stratification, we're talking about something that's not just the differences between individuals. It's also a trait of society. So oftentimes when we think about inequality, we think, well, somebody is doing something that makes them unequal compared to somebody else. Or we might also think, because society says this about those categories of people, we have a tendency to think, well, there's an unfair generalization about those category of people or that category of people. So you can see there it involves beliefs as well. Now, something that I've kind of struggled with as a student from a long time ago, even until now, is this notion that stratification is universal. Anywhere that you have people living together, you're going to have inequality. I should rather say that you're going to have stratification. You're going to have that layering. And so, to some extent, having varying degrees of power in society is good for society. Now, it may not be good for individuals, but how can it be good for society? Because it promotes people to work harder, to, to work harder to help develop themselves and therefore developing society. And as I say that, you can see how it's written into social systems. Stratification. So it's good to have a challenge for people to get better because it promotes the betterment of society at large. Now, perhaps a society would be better if everybody was equal. But when you look at case studies, when you look at reality, you don't see that that has occurred in human history. That may be difficult for some of you to kind of accept and to grasp and 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 to move on from. Now, what is the difference between stratification and inequality? Well, inequality is the subjective part of stratification. So, inequality varies. Stratification is universal, but to the extent that it is there, that can vary. And so that's based on culture. Inequality is based on culture. What it means to have power in China might be different than what it means to have power in Denmark. There's varying degrees of inequality, variation on social power. It's subjective. 
So having said that, I'm going to pull up a, a little bit of a, um, there we go, um, of a PowerPoint that I've got kind of situated and kind of walk through this. Don't want to read too much. I don't like to read uh, too much on PowerPoints, but this is something that I cover with students day one of sociology classes. This is kind of a structure of modern day society. And we have the, uh, let me turn on my laser pointer. We have the micro level down here, and then we have the macro up here. And so what we're going to do in this video is start to think about where some major subject matter terminology of inequality is situated on this graph, okay? Because there's inequality as we relate to individuals, as we relate to one another, but there's also inequality built into cultural systems, social systems. And how do we understand inequality and stratification at the macro level, for example, right? And how does that promote views and attitudes and beliefs and ideology about inequality towards categories of people? Okay. Now, I should say, at the outset, when you talk about inequality, we're talking about power. Now, there's variation on power, on the application of power, the agreements about not only inequality, but equality. Okay. So, that sometimes is a sens sensitive subject, power. Okay, we're all out to get our own power. So, but there's varying degrees of that, and we're going to introduce some of that as we start covering these topics of inequality. Okay, so th this is something that you may have seen in presentations about deviance and crime. Uh, when I talk about crime, this is uh, an opportunity to introduce this idea about perception versus the research. How do we know what we know? And a lot of um, a lot of students that come into my classes, um, introduction to sociology students, haven't you know been well versed in research around a, a number of topical areas, and so as it relates to crime, I often will ask students, "Do you perceive crime being any worse now than it was last year or five, ten years ago?" And usually, people say, "Yeah, it's it's worse," you know, because that's what people perceive. Now, when we think about what influences our perception versus how does education help us to learn things that maybe we didn't know, there's a relationship there. And the same thing can be said about understanding race, ethnicity, gender, social class. We have a perception. For, for example, how have we learned about race? As young people, often that's learned through going through school, interacting with people that are different from you. For people of color, it's part of life, usually. If you are as part of a, a group of people that there's fewer of, and you're in, living in an area where a majority of people are of one race, that becomes part of your life. W.E.B. Du Bois called this the double consciousness, right? In this book, The Soul of Black Folk. But again, this perception, we learn this maybe in elementary school, through interaction with um, family and peers. It's certainly something that occurs over time. As we use social media, we pick up on, you know, cues about people and categories and expectations and all of this, okay? Versus what does the best research on these matters tell us? So, for example, our understanding of race and ethnicity in the United States, based on the research, is so, so different than what the average everyday experience or perception about race is. Very different. Oftentimes we talk about race being a social construct. Now at the same time, looking at the data and the info side of this, we want to you know, see what is said in biology. Whether it's race, ethnicity, sex, gender, social class, orientation. What is the research on biology and psychology and sociology, anthropology, political science, ge uh, geography, history? Okay, so kind of setting the stage for uh, some of that, right? Um, 
The first item on this list of terminology that we're going to look at is stereotype. And before I get into thinking about this as it relates to power, let's look at you know, the definition here. A simplified description applied to every person in some category. Stereotyping is something that everybody does. And I want to talk about that for a second before we get into how, how it relates to inequality. Oftentimes we'll ask my students early in the semester, how do we know people that we don't know? Is it possible for me to understand anything about somebody without ever having a direct conversation with them? And that's an interesting question. We can't fully know somebody without conversing, interacting with them. Although, you could probably look at me, and because I am white, because I'm male, and because I'm of a certain age group, you probably have some assumptions about things. Some of those are going to be right. Just like with stereotyping, sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong, okay? So I like to tell students not to be, you know, as we think about stereotypes, not to beat yourself up over stereotypes. That's part of understanding people that we can't have a conversation with. And if you think about it, in the course of a day, especially for uh, early adults and adults into life, you interact with a lot of people in the course of a day that you don't know all that well. Whether it's driving down the street, you don't have a physical conversation with them or a verbal conversation. But you're trusting that those people have a driver's license and they know what they're doing. And that's kind of a weird way of thinking about stereotypes, but yeah. I mean, there's a lot of assumptions built into everyday life. A lot of stereotypes, okay? So on one hand, it's a practical use for us to be able to interact with people that we don't know. But on the other hand, it's the inequality part. And... The inequality part is what you hear most about. For example, we don't hear about stereotypes in sociology textbooks usually until the chapter on race and ethnicity. Historically, that's where it's resided because it's seen as a bad thing. Stereotype is only a negative thing. I don't think it's just that. Look at the, the language here, the definition. A simplified description. That's all that, you know, it's all it's saying. Applied to every person in some category. Now, what's also listed there is category. And I want to speak about that, the importance of categories and labels. That's who we are. I'm a white male professor, father, husband, and there's all kinds of interpretation of those labels, of those categories. In some cases, they'd be right. In some cases, they're not going to be right. That's stereotyping, right? Okay, so let's move up to the ladder here. The next term is prejudice, prejudging somebody. And here, look at the language, a rigid and unfair generalization. So now we're getting into inequality, unfair generalization about an entire category of people. So you can see, I think, the power differential here of stereotypes. It's a simplified description, okay? And then you get into prejudice, talking about a rigid and unfair generalization, prejudging people. And the next rung up the ladder is discrimination. This is the actual treatment of people. So stereotype and prejudice are ideas, beliefs about things. Everybody's got ideas and beliefs about things. When you act upon them in a certain way that results in unequal treatment against somebody because they're in a certain category, that's discrimination. That behavior, that's where we see racism, sexism, classism, ageism, okay? Discrimination based upon whatever, right? Now then, this is where it gets a little bit different for most people, this idea of institutional prejudice and institutional discrimination. Institutional prejudice are beliefs and ideas built into the functioning of the operation of an organization. It could be also part of culture. If you've got all these different access points in society, schools, churches, workplace, government, that are all, you know, espousing beliefs about a certain category of people, then that's going to impact the people that live in those areas. I mean, we're being told that it's supposed to be this way, so maybe that's how I'm supposed to act. Okay, that's what institutional prejudice is. Institutional discrimination are formal practices or policies. Now, there's an example of institutional discrimination in many points across U.S. history. The law. The law discriminating against a 
category of people based on race. The law is discriminating against categories of people based upon sexual preference or sexual orientation. That's an example of institutional discrimination. Um, and so having said that, let's go forward. And let's put this in, in, in more context. So when we think about prejudice and stereotype, again, values, attitudes, and beliefs, this is your perception, your singular perception of somebody that's based upon a category. Your perception. Now, what influences your perception? Again, family, maybe media, maybe social media. To what extent does research influence your perception of others? Okay? Do you have an informed opinion, informed perception? Or is it based upon just what everybody, what everybody says? Now then, discrimination, again, how you treat other people, that's one-to-one. So now you're taking that perception, and if you're discriminating against somebody, that's you discriminating against another person or you know a, a, a few number of people, part of a category. If you're... If you're doing discrimination, okay? Not everybody's, you know, not everybody is discriminatory against categories of people. But to the extent they are, it's based upon this idea of prejudice and stereotyping, okay? So it's also why, why it's important to address stereotypes, to address prejudices, so we're not unequally treating people a certain way, simply because they're part of a category, Right? Now then, let's put institutional prejudice and institutional discrimination in context. So now we're talking about an organization that is impacting everybody, not just a certain category of people. Now here's where it gets interesting. Because if an organization has a policy or a law against people of a certain category, yes, those people are impacted by that policy. But who else is impacted? Everybody else. So not only are, is that category impacted by the law, but that law is also telling everybody else that's not of that category that this is how you're supposed to treat those people. So that's you know what we mean by one or many to everybody. So down here, it's one to one. All this right here. It's how you might interact with one person or a couple of people. And people can understand that, how you treat other people. But how do organizations, how do churches... How do schools, how does the government, how do workplaces treat categories of people? Now, in some cases in the United States, there are laws against discrimination against categories of people. Laws change. Culture changes. And what's acceptable in terms of power and inequality changes too. And those are related. Okay? Moving forward here. And again, this is what I was speaking about just a moment ago. How do we know people that we don't know? And that's based on stereotypes. And we learn that in, in lots of different ways. Family, usually, but your experiences. But this is also why it's, why it's important for experiences that you have within organizations and institutions are proper as it relates to equality, as it relates to discrimination, which might be against the law, but also as it relates to prejudice and stereotypes. Is it the job of organizations in society to train their employees on the law? Yes, it is. Is it the job of organizations in society to train people on how to treat people that are different from you? Yeah, it is. So... As we think about race and ethnicity and sex and gender going forward and class and ageism, let's also look at these different categories here because these are basically descriptions of societies at any given point So, and how society treats categories of people. So this is presented, as you can see, from from top to bottom and bottom to top, it probably would be better if this was this way. And if you look at a textbook, it is listed that way, where you have, pl you have pluralism on one side and you have genocide on the other side. Let me try to get that right. And so you have everything else in the middle. So on one extreme, you have genocide, okay, genocide, which is systematic killing of one category of people by another. And then on the other side, you have pluralism, 
which is people of all races and ethnicities are distinct but have equal social standing. Now, it says races or ethnicities, but this could be other categories as well, all right? Pluralism, that everybody's equal. And then on the other end of the equation, you have genocide. So that's the, the distribution of power, if you want to think about that, again, in society. And then in the, in the middle, I mean, how do you get from genocide to pluralism? We see episodes of segregation where there's separation of categories of people. And then there's assimilation where minorities are gradually adopted into the dominant culture, and that's done through a number of ways, through policy and law and changing of norms and culture. And then to a point of the greatest equality in modern civilization would be pluralism, where um, every group has distinct and equal social standing. All right. Okay, so... I'm going to end right there and uh, wrap this up and make sure you watch everything all the way through and answer all the questions if, if you have those. And um, thanks.